All right. Thank you, Glenn. Um, it's great to be here. Uh, Ten years after Tech Archaeology in San Francisco, it was really quite a, a great meeting. And I think getting a lot of different folks together to discuss just, you know, all of this that we're talking about. Um, at the Museum of Modern Art in San Francisco, I, my job is to install and maintain the works that are on view in the galleries. And um, uh, so to, um, tonight, or today, what I'm going to talk about, uh, what I'd like to go through is some examples with our collection and um, go through some of the questions that I ask myself, um, trying to, and really focusing more on how is this work uh, being installed in, this, in the gallery and in the space. And uh, it, I think hopefully we'll build on some of the conversations that were happening earlier today. And one of the things that uh, in particular I thought it was great to hear um, Heather um, discussing working with the artist. And you get a little sense of the process that they're going through to get this stuff displayed into a gallery setting. And um, some of the things I definitely want to talk about are some of the common um, problems or issues that I encounter when I'm working with, you know, how to install this stuff and some, you know, possibly some misconceptions uh, and some tricks, or not tricks, but just strategies and methodologies in terms of uh, how, to, how to overcome some of those issues, things to keep in mind. So I was like, what's a good way to start? And this is a great quote from Sun Tzu about um, pre-planning, 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 pre-planning. There was a great question earlier about how much time did it take to go through those monitors. And it really is, um, uh, it's true, it takes a lot of forethought, um, particularly if you have a very limited window of time to do an installation. So, um, you know, the museum, uh, it's show business. The show has to open when and we've said it's open. There's a lot of people riding on that. And sometimes the pressure can be quite intense. Um, it's definitely not um, an ideal environment to be able to go in and, uh, well, let's experiment and see what happens. There's definitely some things you can only try once you're in the gallery, but for the most part, you really have to, you know, think of it as a campaign and what can we accomplish in each day and, and, uh, and, and work towards that. So the first question that I ask myself is, what is it? And um, that may seem like a really obvious question, but it really takes you down a lot of different paths in terms of w w what are we trying to do, you know? And the, what's the technology that's required or the uh, infrastructure necessary or people or staff to install either a single channel projection or is it a multi-channel monitor installation? Does it require plants over here? Is it, are we using old technology? Do we, can we use new things? Does it matter where the tech comes from? Is it synchronized? Is it, you know, is it on the street and it really doesn't matter? We're going to steal the equipment? I mean, you know, the, from my, you know, at, at, a, at a larger museum, that's not necessarily the case, but frequently we're working with, <laughs> I mean, hopefully not too many secrets here, but a lot of work comes to us from galleries or quite different settings than would, say, take place here or be appropriate installing in a larger museum. And everything from, um, having something be a lot more reliable because we don't have the staff that can change the film every 10 minutes like it was installed originally. So there's a lot of strategies that we sometimes have to come up with to help um, solve some of those issues. This is a um, process diagram from uh, the Media Matters or Matters in Media Art, which is a um, sort of a co-production or a, a conversation with um, uh, some folks. but. The, you'll notice that that first question is, what is it? And it, really, the, the details that are outlined in this, this the Matters in Media Art, the MoMA and the Tate and the New Art Trust realize, like, oh, we have this, this, we're sharing some of this work. Can we come up with some common language to talk about what it is? And the reason I'm bringing this up in part is because down here under acquisitions, I have a laser pointer, um, there's a great site, or, you know, just talking about what is it, if you're going to acquire this work, what is it that you need to know? And so part of that is like this um, installation instructions template is just a good series of questions and very specific details and some, some prompts about what is it that a piece might require. And um, I, I definitely recommend checking that out. Also then like how, where do I get information about stuff? 
um, we've, there's definitely been a little bit of alphabet soup about, you know, cable names or, you know, product um, equipment. I just like these two books. They're good primers on, on things you might need to know. I reference them quite frequently. Um, the audio dictionary is written with a sense of humor, which is really nice. And there's a great um, glossary in the back with just some real world applications about when you might need some of that stuff. And then Video Demystified, it's been, it's, you know, currently in its fifth edition, and it's just good, clear information. And it gets as technical as you would need if you're an engineer, but it's also good, like, what, what is that? You know, those half the things that Heather spoke about earlier, what, what were those again? And you, it would be able to explain it in very clear detail. And then just, um, the internet is an amazing resource. And in fact, most of the images that you're gonna see me pull up about different stuff, if they're not from our collection, I just lifted them right from Wikipedia or the internet. So there's a lot of information out there. I think um, that the web is as tech-minded as it is. There's, you know, a lot of people writing about different things on it, so. So what are the parts? Um, I thought it was great that Joanna brought up um, similar things. There's, a me there's media, there's the media and the player, and they're very intricately linked. There's the display. Then there's where is it going to be displayed. Then a very important thing, how are those things connected? You'll notice these monitors over here, there's, you know, there's a lot of wires behind there. So what just what is that and how are those? And then what are the electrical requirements? I think one of the number one things that doesn't get addressed or isn't addressed until near the end is just how much juice are those things going to take? And some ways the technology has gotten more efficient using electricity, in other ways they've just gotten bigger and, you know, so just understanding what those requirements are is going to save you a lot of headache as you're planning for something. And then maintenance, and that's, um, a his, you know, sort of a hidden cost. Um, the projector that's running here, like that lamp at some point is going to fail or need to be replaced, and that's something to consider in, during the life of an, inst you know, an installation. The work we saw from the video about what it takes to keep the monitors clean, that's, you know, that's stuff that has to be taken into account. It's very easy to sort of see the surface of everything working smoothly without knowing, you know, just what is behind that curtain and how much effort and time that really takes to keep that going. And if you plan for it, it's a lot less uh, painful than later, you know, if you're having to always play catch up. So where is it displayed? I, I, a thing in terms of like planning on where is it going to go, just thinking about what is the, you know, where, where is it, is it? If it's a projection, what's the environment? How many people are coming through? Um, uh, sort of just the physical um, parameters of where it is that you are. So I'm just going to run through some math here. Uh, Ohm's law, how much electricity? A lot of things are rated in, in um, you know, watts, how many watts a amplifier takes up or um, a projector or things like that. But the fuses that will blow in your facility are gonna blow because of the amps. So it's really important to know just how many amps of electricity am I, is, is something taking. And um, it's also useful um, in terms of understanding how, if you're using speakers, like that you're not gonna destroy some equipment. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that later in terms of the relationship um, with that, with Ohm's Law with that. Um, sound and light both operate with this uh, similarity and there's a common misconception about uh, how, how bright a projector do I need to get? Or, um, oh, I have to put the projector on the other side of the room, is that too far away? And really what it is, is it's how big is your picture? So this size image, for example, that you're seeing here, like the projector, could be anywhere in there. It, it's the, it's just how big is it um, that's going to change. So if I were to make the, focus it as a smaller picture, it'd be as if I were making that lights for that point source more intense. It, that it works, uh, sound works the same way is kind of cool. You know, more as an intellectual exercise. In an actual gallery, um, what's really more of important is is how is that sound reflected in that space. So, you know, me speaking here now, I mean, I'm being amplified, but if I were just to talk to the side and, you know, you're hearing me directly from my mouth, 
and there's some good acoustic insulation in here, so there's very few of those early reflections. But if we were in uh, a hard floored, hard walled room and I'm talking to you, then you know the sound would be a lot more, uh, just there'd be more sound, I would be less clear. So when you're setting up speakers in an installation, that's something to really consider in terms of how is that sound. And um, I put the myth of soundproofing. Um, soundproofing is, is like an ideal state, a soundproof gallery, and it almost never exists, or it would be so costly to actually generate something that's soundproof. So if you're putting an acoustic paneling in a room, really what you're doing is you're helping to make that room sound better, and you're helping to avoid some of the reflections that are traveling into other galleries. So I think it's pretty, um, it makes sense you understand how if I put up a wall, uh, I'm going to block light. I can make a light block. And then it's, you know, sometimes struggling then, well, why, why am I still hearing that sound? I have this wall up. Well, you have hard floors and that sound is just reflecting all through there. And some artists can work with that either by, you know, they don't care or, but frequently you'll have um, very specific instructions on, I want this room to be isolated or I don't want it to be interrupted or even as a curator, um, or considering like how are we placing these pieces together if you have two competing works, one that requires, you know, is, the idea is to be contemplative and the other is really loud and, you know, bombastic, how do you, how do you address that? Um, where is it? Pal CCAM, NTSC. Um, this is a general map about you know where you'll see that. You'll notice um, you could also say this is a map of like what is the power system in that country. So for example, Australia runs on PAL and they have um, 220, 50 cycle power, whereas North America is you know 60 cycle. How does that relate to video? You have 30 frames per second, and that's based on the power system in that country. Europe, you know. In, Rest, large parts of the rest of the world, they have 220, 50 cycle power. And so their video frames are 25 frames per second. So, you know, in addition to then um, the resolution, which we'll talk about a little bit, but, but that basic power um, conflict, it's definitely something to consider. So if in the United States we don't have so much PAL, and one thing to consider then, it's, it is very expensive to find PAL monitors, you can't, or you can find them, but then sometimes you need to consider like how much it, do I need to step up the voltage for that? And those are just things to consider. If you need transformers, in terms of understanding how much electricity is required to you know run a particular gallery. Media. Um, what what is the media? I mean, that's frequently one. So I know it's a single channel projection somewhere, but what's the media? Is it NTSC or PAL? Oh, they want it to be on a monitor. Do we have any PAL monitors if it's a PAL video? Um, the question about media and player are really, they're really linked. Because, I mean, you, it's, you can't have one without the other, and they obviously need to communicate. But it's then how many channels? Is it, you know, 25 channel piece? Is it one channel? What, how, what, just, what is the magnitude of what we're talking about? Is it user generated content? Some things don't really have media per se. Um, an exhibition format versus archival format. I'm going to talk about that in just a second. But so, for example, this Vito Conchi piece, there's a tape. You get to watch Vito sort of saying lewd things to you um, while you sit in the chair on, you know, in, in, on view. And someone else then is able to see you. So this is sort of a combination of something that's user generated and with media. Or it, in the case of Dan Graham's piece, there's really no media other than the camera. I mean, if the, the, the live activity, that closed circuit situation, creates the, creates the piece. Um, Don Byrne, seven channel video piece with a um, uh, slide in the background. Um, it was really good to hear earlier Heather talk about the, you know, this, Doug working with all these materials, these master tapes and things like that, and it made me realize, in my role as a preparator, I very rarely deal with a master tape. 
Um, I'm usually, I'm getting the, arch the, the exhibition format. And uh, as it was described earlier, the archival formats, you want to have as much information as possible. In a display format, you want to have as little as possible so that it'll play smoothly. And finding that balance, I'm actually very curious to see where's the, where's the point at which the eye can't tell. Um, I, I have a feeling, though, it, I mean, it, I think it might be subjective. Uh, just like we, you know, 18 frames per second was a, a film speed standard, and now it's 24 frames per second. But, I, you know, if, if it's slower or faster, some people claim that they can see that. Don Byrne, um, this was an example where I was making uh, an exhibition format. Um, the masters for this piece are on um, one inch tape. And the, an, a previous exhibit had shown it as laser disc. We were not wanting to show it as laser disc. We took the opportunity to make DVDs out of it. Um, and, but what I ended up doing was making those DVDs from a, uh, a DigiBeta master that was made from the one inch tape. So just all of these iterations. Um, it's a black and white picture. So I mean, in terms of what am I thinking about when I'm doing that, matching black and white um, images on any colored device is really tricky. And it's older video. Um, if you're not familiar with her work, there's, I have some slides later, but you kind of get a sense. She is exploiting the fact that a CRT tube and a camera if there's a, a, a highlight, it will actually burn in on the phosphor of the camera, um, that line. Um, so it's really, it's kind of grainy. It's, um, she's using, the original one was using uh, tape, you know, reel-to-reel -reel tape um, to record it. So uh, converting that to DVD uh, has, it, you know, a lot of challenges in terms of um, how much can you compress it so that it doesn't, you don't see artifacting. Um, in a way that's undesirable. The player, you know, um, just understanding, like, what, what are we getting ourselves into? What, once we've been able to identify what the media is, sometimes the media and the player, like, well, we can't, we don't, we don't want to show it on a, on a DVD. Uh, or, I, I, man, that computer it just was a pain in the ass the last time we used it. I don't, I don't want to go that route. Like, is there a way we can work around this? What, what's the strategy that we can use to show it? Or even just physical, we have to turn that thing on and off every day. I can't, where, where can we put that thing? Is there a, a limitation in terms of how close to the player or the, the display device can we get? Um, those are things that will come into mind. And then the displays. Now a lot of this, it's, and, it, and it's true, the display is sort of what manifests itself in the, in the view. So in some ways, um, this is the most driven by how has it been shown before, what are the artist's considerations. The player, that's still definitely a part of the conversation, but it can be, um, you know, as we've seen, the, oh, well, the, it was distributed as a three-quarter umatic tape. So, you know, Am I able to get a usable signal from that if that's the only media that I have, or or do we, you know, can we do a little more research and get a better, a better piece? I think this is something that's true for a lot of work from the 80s and early 90s is the what it was distributed on, and then how going in and reviewing your collection. Like, do we really want to say that this three-quarter inch tape from Arthur Rossler is all is that's that's the master? Can we, you know, can we? Is there some arrangement we can make or some way that we can make sure that we have that piece in as high quality as possible? And whether that's going back to the distributors to talk to them about that or whether that's working with the artist studio or, or whatever strategy. Um, just a comment about um, resolutions. Here's a nice graph of some simple resolutions that you might encounter. Um, it's a little confusing and I simplified it. <laughs> Because this is, I would say, in the 10 years so, you know, till now that I've been installing work at the museum, um, this is more what the resolutions that I've been dealing with. There are definitely exceptions, and it's true that as we, as projection technology increases and, and formats are trying to be understood, you know, um, this will change. And that's, the, that's something you just get used to, is that it will change. But really, the other thing that I want to point out, I was going to simplify it even more. 
uh, really, 16 by 9 is widescreen and 4 by 3. So if you're just talking about in general conversation, 4 by 3 is your classic older style monitor. 16 by 9 is the sort of the newer, what you would purchase now if you were buying, you know, an LCD screen for your house. Projectors, however, are sort of, they're in the 8 by 5. Technically, that's what it is. But it's displaying a 16, you know, essentially a 16 by 9. You know, it's a widescreen projector. And same thing with the 3 by 2, you know, because DV NTSC is 720 by 480, just sort of a, you know, I, I won't go into a discussion about square pixels and rectangular pixels. I think, fortunately, we've moved a little past that. But it's technically is 3-2. But if you're talking about DV NTSC, you're talking about a 4 by 3 picture. Um, and, you know, the, in the previous slide, you can see the litany of, you know, the XGA, well, VGA, then XGA, SXGA, SXGA plus. My favorite is the QSXGA. You know, just keep adding these appellations on there. Um, it is interesting to note, like, that 2K over here on the side, you know, that was what Heather was talking about in terms of the, the projector that, um, that they were, or the, the resolution for, um, for cinema, digital cinema. And you just get a sense then that's just a little wider than, you know, HD monitor and sort of the, whatever, the, the current standard of which there really is no standard for high definition. Uh, I went to hear some folks talk about high definition in, um, in Canada. And um, it was interesting, uh, one, to hear, you know, um, the minister who goes to Washington to argue for the broadcast rights along the border which was just eye-opening to me that that was something that was negotiated. But, um, but the, 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 the consensus, there really is no definition for high definition. High definition just means better, greater than standard definition, which is why you can get that whole litany of things. So, so I think that that's even an issue in terms of dealing with pieces for monitor. Um, I've had a number of different works where here's, there's a specified monitor um, for a particular work, but the picture doesn't quite fit that monitor. So, you know, am I zooming in a little bit? Like, if it, do you want to lose the head, or do you want them to be slightly squished and, you know, trying to... And I think this is as much artists understanding what the technology is and producing work that can be displayed on, a, you know, contemporarily available equipment, um, as it is the fact that these standards do change. Buy or rent. That's a classic um, part of, um, a big part of my uh, w responsibility at the museum is to understand the, you know, there's not infinite amounts of money, there's not infinite amounts of time, um, there's si uh, significant storage questions, uh, the obsolescence or not of the equipment. So the buy or rent question I is a really significant one. Um, in the States, it's generally cheaper to buy equipment and then keep it. And then you have it for at least a few more shows than it is to rent it. Um, and I think that's partly because of the, just there's not enough turnover. Now, I'm not sure if that's still true in, you know, on the East Coast. Uh, there's certainly a lot of media production that goes on here. Uh, and I'd be curious to, to know from folks here. Um, but for example, in Europe, it's the, the cities are a lot closer together. There's a lot easier for, say, a company in Berlin to ship work uh, monitors for view, you know, to be on view somewhere else. And an example of that is um, Candace Bright's Working Class Hero. Um, it's 25 plasma displays on the wall, um, and uh, it's uh, all of these folks singing. Um, a cappella, uh, John Lennon's album, Working Class Hero. Um, for us, it was, um, and Candace has, um, w it was great with documentation, um, which we'll go through in, in a second. But um, it was cheaper for us to buy, buy, um, uh, buy about a third uh, it, to rent this equipment from Germany, have it shipped over, uh, and and then return, then it would have been for us to purchase it. Um, which was just, that's the first time I'd encountered that in a, in a while, uh, that it was actually, that it was cheaper to do that. Uh, 
Um, this is a great piece to talk about in terms of what kind of requirements do you have. There's 25 monitors there. Um, you know, that's a lot of weight on that wall. So um, she had, you know, is experienced with this and is, you know, a, someone who's definitely considered people installing this work and so ha has very clear descriptions about a lot of the technical requirements. But it's something to think about, you know, when you're wanting to hang five projectors in a gallery, is there more than sheetrock in that ceiling? You know, is there a way to suspend that amount of weight? Um, and it's not then just the projector, it's the pole that's holding it. You know, where, where, how much is that? Um, how much electricity do 25 monitors take up? You know, at each one, it's pretty efficient at, you know, uh, 2.3 amps, but then altogether, you know, you need four or five circuits of power, which may or not be easy to get. And I'm being, I'm being blinked at. I think I have five minutes. Um, <clears throat> these are her documents, uh, preparations of the space. Um, very clear, just telling you, like, this is what you can expect with the space. Um, really great uh, outline of, um, uh, you know, equipment that you could use and m trying to make it as easy as possible for folks to, um, uh, to, to, to install this work. Um, and this was the bill. It was, you know, $18,000 to rent this stuff. That's the players, monitors, the mounts. Um, all the networking hardware to, for the players, the computer to run it, extra power, transformers. Um, that, just the monitors alone would have been about 50,000 for us. So, so it's just interesting in, it, you know, in terms of then how are you um, doing this. This is a permanent collection work, so it's definitely one of our considerations is how will we display this in the future. We took a look at those numbers and realized that in, you know, when, when likely would we show this again, in 10 years? you know, let's address that situation then. Maybe that would be an opportune time to purchase whatever it is. Currently, we wouldn't, um, 25 was just large enough that it would put it maybe outside of the shared obsolete pool. Um, but um, that this is, you know, it's a conversation that happens among multiple departments. Uh, and then, um, just sewing through some of the displays, I think you'll talk about this a lot more tomorrow. Um, but the, just some general types of monitors, CRT monitors, LCD, plasma display, sort of what they are, really basic. It's a cathode ray tube. Um, uh, this is a good, just an example of Mary Lucier's piece that's sort of exploiting that. You know, it really is the, the, the cathode picture for projection also. Um, is, it, you know, the cathode ray projector uh, projects black. It's one of the only ones that actually, when there's not a signal there in terms of the video, it's not projecting something. Whereas um, the LCD and, DL, LCD and DLP projectors, there's, there's still, the black is not as black as it could be. So you'll have a lot of artists requesting that. Um, Liquid crystal, um, just essentially, there's actually is liquid crystals in there that, you know, uh, move around very quickly. Plasma is sort of a similar idea in that it's um, a charged space, but it's sort of the electricity is making the, the plasma, um, those little subpixels uh, illuminate. With Candace's piece, one of the questions was, could we use uh, LCD monitors? They certainly would be cheaper than plasma displays. But the viewing angle on LCD is a significant thing to consider. Um, because of the polarizing uh, certain angles, and you can see this on your laptop, the, the color shifts or um, goes dark. And it, if you were to have that across 25 monitors, where mostly you're seeing the majority of monitors at an angle, that really wasn't acceptable. So that was a large part of why the, the plasma. Um, projectors, uh, that is a Mark IV uh, projector. It's at the Griffith Observatory in Los Angeles. I love that thing. Um, it's <laughs> one of the star projectors. And I was really glad when they did their upgrade that they, they kept it. I mean, it's just on display. It's sad to see that it's not being projected. Um, working with projectors, cathode ray projector, the, for a cathode, a CRT projector, um, it's essentially three CRT tubes, one for each color with a lens in front of it. And then you're, you know, aligning them. And uh, Gary Hill's viewer is a good example of why you would want it to be black. The, 
it would be very difficult to get those seams to match. Or if you were using, you know, a DLP projector, you'd have then a border at the top. Like it would be, it would be ch challenging to to try and have this appear like you can get it with the CRT. That's just a, as a quality that that has. Um, but it's expensive. Those lamps are really difficult to relamp if you can even do it anymore because CRT is not being made. Um, you have, for each projector, you have to essentially set it up three times because you're focusing in uh, each, uh, each lens, whereas with the DLP and uh, LCD projectors, that's not necessarily the case. Um, Steve McQueen's drum roll is another one. He's very particular about what projection and is very engaged in terms of communicating uh, with you about what, what he wants for the image quality. LCD, <coughs> this is a typical you know, using the additive light. Um, the, the way that it's working is it's projecting um, through a prism. So each color, your single color source, your single light source is being uh, divided with mirrors and projected into um, a prism, which, you know, uh, that's the prism there. These are, you know, it, it's a beautiful thing, but what happens is that the, um, the LCD, um, the, the, the little polarizing panel will shift, and so you'll get, as it ages, the, it'll color. Um, you drag me off stage if you need to. <laughs> it's about time to wrap it up. Um, one challenge uh, with LCD uh, is Christian Markley's, uh, like, it, that could be illustrated with Christian Markley's video quartet. Um, he has a lot of black and white footage that he lifted from a number of different sources, and the the color quality is very different depending on the source. But having four projectors match edge to edge is really challenging. Um, DLP. Um, I'm just going quickly through here to get to Bruce Connors' three screen ray. You know, um, these were less challenging to match, mainly because they were all brand new, um, and that's really, you know, um, helpful. But even with this, the center image, you know, we had to use a gel because we just couldn't um, calibrate it in such a way that, um, that the three would be identical, which is, you know, clearly important to do with that. Um, uh, speakers. Uh, are important and sound is important. It's half of your exhibit many times. Um, I guess the, the last thing that I'll leave you with is um, you can have passive or active and the advantages to a passive system um, is that you only have to have a speaker at that location and run a wire to it. Um, if you have a, an active speaker at that location then you'd have to figure out how to run power. Sometimes that's not an issue. Um, it, it really depends on the nature of the thing. The advantage with an active system is that you don't have to match the amp and the speaker. And usually there's protection circuits in it, so it's less likely to, to be damaged by having a signal that's too hot. That's more in terms of in a live situation than just general playback. But if you're doing a passive one, it's really important to match the speaker and the amp. And um, a common misconception is like, well, you know, I'll have the, the speaker will be rated higher so it can handle more than the amp could give it. But um, because of Ohm's law, um, that's actually exactly opposite of what you'd want to do. So just a rule of thumb is you want to have twice the power of the amplifier than the speaker. So for example, a 150 watt speaker is 300 watt amp. But if you buy that, they're probably going to call it a 600 watt amp. So I mean, it's just in terms of understanding what it is that you're looking at when you're looking at whatever a product is. Um, I'm going to quickly run through all these pretty pictures uh, and just leave you with uh, not even that. <laughs> exactly. Uh, oh, the, you know, in um, terms of life safety, um, it is really important to know what not to touch on the CRT monitor if you open it up. Um, those are all examples of some of the documentation that we keep. Um, it's pretty important to, it is, to document your iterations. And, and we're very interested to know if a work has been shown somewhere else, like how was that done? It really informs you know, the forensic science of installing this work where frequently I'm, I'm aware of uh, the faulty documentation that I've been given 
or, or just even like, what were they thinking when they made this document? And I'll even do that myself. I'll review material that I've even made and like, man, how could I have missed that? So it's, you know, that's an important conversation that I think uh, we all have in terms of what is the collective knowledge about how this work is being installed. Um, this is a time lapse of uh, our installation of Drawing Restraint, uh, the Matthew Barney exhibit uh, at the museum. We realized it was probably going to be the only time that we would ever tear down all the walls on one side of the building. So um, we thought it would be worth documenting. What was great is that you also get a sense of how many people are involved in putting an exhibition together. And uh, it, that's been a great one to show to you know, our trustees or just supporters of the museum. Like, yeah, there's an awful lot of people behind the scenes making what you see in the gallery function. Takes a village. Takes a yeah. village. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. We actually do have a few minutes for questions because we're now going to set up the um, stage for our final um, panel discussion. So um, do, does anyone have any questions for Steve? I'm just going to ask, since um, everybody was ooing and eyeing when you showed um, some of the documentation, will you, could you share that with us somehow? <laughs> sure. Because we may be putting some of the information that's being shared at Tech Focus, um, perhaps on a in, in a web form in the future. So yeah, we may ask you for that. Information wants to be free. Uh, can you talk a little bit about any uh, automation that you have at SF MoMA for shows turning on and off, things like that? Um, we uh, yes, um, it's. We definitely try and, I mean, part of how can we make it robust, um, there's some equipment that definitely can be turned on and off with the electricity, and so setting it up with, um, the, like, when the lights come on in a building. Um, I, my job has de definitely um, become easier because of uh, all of the, the emphasis in um, uh, point of sale, or when you, you know, having video in public places, that, that, that technology is driving a lot of, um, you know, what we're using and what artists are using when they're setting up stuff. But um, we're pretty, really pretty basic. Uh, we have folks who turn things on and off. I mean, we definitely could rely on the, tur the, the, the a timer for the projector to turn itself off, but um, we found it just, it's, uh, for us, to be able to have a person that's there to make that round and identify, okay, did it really go off? Is everything okay? Uh, and it's also good to have then that technician set of eyes on that work. Um, I think that that's more important in terms of when it's being starting up. Um, frequently then it'll be like, man, that, who knocked that projector out? There's always just that little, you know, tweaking that's required when you go through like that. Um, I know that there's a lot of other ways. You could definitely set up um, equipment to be controlled through the web. Um, at present, we haven't had enough of a demand for that to really make that cost effective for us. Um, we have a couple of pieces coming up that we're installing this fall that would definitely benefit from having um, remote access to the computer or the server that's, that's functioning. You know, making it work, and so we'll be exploring a little bit with that. But otherwise, um, really, it's it's using, if, if it can turn itself on and off with the power that um, and not be detrimental to it, which uh, I was glad to hear about the CRT monitors, since we also have that pool of uh, PVM monitors. But briefly brought up the, the uh, concept of safety, more about touching a C the inside of a CRT, but what about older pieces, like pike pieces that use non-broadcast, non-standard monitors that sometimes have the risk of fire? Um, how do you handle fire safety, and is it an issue with the, in the overall picture of the institution? And I was going to say security as well. In a large institution, that's probably not as much of an issue. But in the gallery, how many times has somebody walked off with the players or the media? Um, we definitely try and theft-proof things. Um, you know, uh, it's and and part of that is like where can we, um, 
you know, how can you squirrel stuff away? Or, or what is a setup? Is that projector tall enough that most folks wouldn't be able to get to it? We have had stuff disappear from um, education areas and places that aren't specifically the galleries. I think that there's definitely some more watchful eye in the gallery. Um, as far as then, like, the safety of, I think there's visitor safety, certainly, with exposed uh, monitors. Uh, there was a lamp, I don't recall the artist, but it was definitely, you know, exposed tubes and that was part of it. It's just this, this, the way that these monitors were with each other and, you know. So I think in that regard, like, any work that's sort of fragile, if you touch it, uh, what kind of safeguards are you using? And we would use something like that, so probably a plinth or, you know, that's, or a base that's wide enough. Um, Certainly, I wouldn't want to see someone, you know, have a catastrophic danger, but I, part of me feels like if you want to touch that and it bites you, then, you know, it may be that's a lesson that, <laughs> that people should learn. But, um, but there, it's really, um, the only, the other safety would really be earthquake. Uh, in California, that uh, is a very significant uh, consideration. So in terms of how we're installing stuff, that it's not going to topple, and that then also, you know, Depending on the situation, um, if we're screwing down equipment so that it won't j jostle off a shelf and you know crown someone, uh, that's a way that we would handle that also. Well, I'm talking more about like, the pieces themselves and leaving them on 24 hours. That's we we don't we turn most of those off. I mean, we turn almost everything off um, at the end of the evening. Uh, you know. If, and it'll be interesting, like if with uh, like the CRT monitor, like to look at that and find out if is that really the best thing. If we, if that's the, uh, if it's better for the longevity of the piece to keep it on. But in terms of players and other equipment, we we shut most of that down. Occasionally, it'll make more sense just to leave a computer running all the time. But then um, we have, you know, it's then uh, like just the building um, sprinkler and that whole fire safety that's built in. Uh, if it's a particularly troubling work, I mean, we have a pike in the in the collection. I don't recall it having um, an electrical issue that you know that just having it on could potentially be uh, an issue. But um, we would look at that, and part of it is then consulting with our engineers. And I think that's that's also a big thing. Is is you know I, I know a, a little bit about a lot of this stuff, but really, if if you get into a situation like who do you ask and being in to know enough like. That, that looks a little sketchy, that, you know, that wiring there. Should we have someone look at that? Is there a better thing that we should do? And our building engineers um, are good at helping to identify some of that stuff. And, uh, and I think that they enjoy having that consultation and working with art projects. It, um, from their normal world, you know, fixing the toilets or the AC and other places, I think it's, uh, they enjoy the... All right, thank you. Thank you.